the All Star Game had some of their lowest ratings that they've had in years. And I want to ask you, you know, I mean, I watched the game and I I was entertained. I enjoyed it. What do you think baseball has to do to get people to start watching the game on TV again? Well, that's a good question. It's troubling because we've got a lot of really good young players to watch these days. And for people not to be interested enough to tune in is uh, is concerning, to say the least. Now, maybe we have to work it that the best players are going to play um, more often than just three or four innings. Maybe we're going to tell all these great starting pitchers Unless you're hurt, you're pitching in the All-Star game. Because just look at the National Leaguers who didn't pitch for whatever reason. Kershaw, Baumgartner, Arietta, Strasburg, Syndergaard. You can't miss five of those guys and expect people to be just absolutely overjoyed about the, the All-Star game. Now, those guys all, or at least four of them, had legitimate excuses. But I think maybe that could be part of it. If it actually does matter which supposedly it does then let's get the best players let's cut the rosters a little bit let's play the best players more and let's make sure the best pitchers show up and pitch do you think that the ballot stuffing has affected the all-star game i mean we had an entire infield of cubs we had a bunch of different guys over the years like you know the royals when the kansas city fans were really pushing their players do you think some of this ballot stuffing has actually hurt the game you know, I don't. I think it's great that the fans vote. They are paying the freight for so much of this. The least they we can do is let them vote. Now, do they always get it right? No. Do they make some mistakes? Absolutely. But I'm not ready to say we got to take the fan vote away. But if people are really that upset about the All-Star game, and I'm not, I think it's a great three-day celebration of the game. Um, then then we're going to have to start making some difficult decisions. You don't get a player from every team. Again, we'll cut the roster. We'll, we'll try to make sure teams show up ready to win, uh, all that. But I just don't know if there's a, <laughs> there's a better way to do it than the way we're doing it right now. Tim's going to be part of the coverage of uh, Sunday Night Baseball. He'll be on Baseball Tonight at 7 o'clock on ESPN. Baseball Tonight presented Sunday Night Countdown presented by Chevrolet. So, Tim, the Red Sox, when picked up, drew Pomerantz for the Padres, but it seems like they paid a very steep price to get him. Uh, Keith Law has him ranked Espinosa as one of his top 15 prospects. Yeah, this kid's got a chance to be great. He's only 18 years old. We probably won't see him for another three years. Um, There's word out there that he's at least something like a young Pedro Martinez which is really saying something. He's not going to be Pedro Martinez. There's only one of that guy, believe me. But in order to get something good, and Drew Pomerantz is a good pickup by the Red Sox, you have to give up something. And usually teams these days, when they make a trade at the deadline, they have to get pitching back in return. And the Padres got a really good young pitcher. But as always, this is baseball. You're never quite sure with injuries and everything else if a guy is going to work out, but this guy is certainly worth taking a chance on for the Padres, especially given they're not going anywhere this year and probably next year either. The Red Sox, this is one of the many deals they've made, Tim. They acquired Aaron Hill. They acquired Michael Martinez, now Drew Pomerantz. What do you think of the deals the Red Sox have done as they seem to be loading up for the playoff chase? Well, I like what the Red Sox have done. I like how aggressive they have been. I really like the Brad Ziegler trade with Arizona, not just to protect uh, Craig Kimbrell until he gets back as you know, at least a part-time closer, but Ziegler can be a really good eighth-inning guy once Kimbrell is healthy again. Uh, Aaron Hill is a really nice pickup. Uh, he can play all over the infield, and with his swing, he should hit a few balls off that wall and over that wall. Um, And, of course, the Pomerantz move is something that they had to do. They simply were not going to the playoffs with the starting rotation that they had. And now you look at them with the offense they have, and they're pretty close to being as good as any team in the American League, Um, assuming Pomerantz pitches really well. Stephen Wright has a very good second half like the first half. And, of course, David Price becomes a great pitcher again. 
Tim, before the All-Star break, there are reports that the Red Sox were looking at the Phillies' Jeremy Hellickson. If I could bring it local here for a minute, uh, do you think the Red Sox are still interested in Hellickson, or do you think they're going to move on now that they got Pomerantz? Well, I think they got the starting pitcher that they wanted. Um, but I wouldn't be shocked. I'm, I'm going to say they're done going to get starting pitching, but I wouldn't be shocked if they made one more run at Hellickson, who's pitched a little bit better this year than last year. He's a veteran. He's pretty unflappable. He's pitched in the American League East before. So that would certainly make some sense, but I can't see the Red Sox giving up very much to get him, in part because they just gave up a lot to get Drew Pomeroy. What do you think of the Phillies roster right now? They're probably going to be selling. There's talk about Hellickson. There's talk about Cameron Rupp as well. Maybe Jenmar Gomez. Do you think there's going to be three or four Phillies move before the trade deadline? Um, I wouldn't say that many. But, again, the Phillies are still in a rebuilding mode here as they should be. And I wouldn't be surprised at all if Gomez went to a team. He's the perfect example of a guy who is a closer and a good one for one team and he can go to a contender and be a seventh or eighth inning guy and extremely valuable. Again, Hellickson could help a lot of teams, maybe not as your third starter in a playoff situation, but a guy who could be a third, fourth, or fifth during a season and help you get to the playoffs. Um, there's quite a bit of talent there on the Phillies, and some of those guys are movable, so I would be surprised if they didn't make a couple of moves and continue to build that farm system, which is getting better and better every day. On Sunday Night Baseball on ESPN, we're going to have Yankees and Red Sox. Two teams are going in very opposite directions. Tim, I wanted to get your thoughts. Reports came out yesterday that Brian Cashman reportedly does want to hit the restart button and get the Yankees kind of unload some players, be sellers of the trade deadline, but apparently Randy Levine and Hal Steinbrenner are saying, no, we don't want to be sellers at all. You know, What do you think about this divide in the Yankees organization? Well, it's not the first time they've had that, and I think, in the end, the best thing for the Yankees to do is to move people, is to be sellers, not buyers. They should trade Aroldis Chapman, get a couple of young players for him, and then re-sign him, if they like, after the season as a free agent. They should trade Carlos Beltran, who's had a very productive year, but is obviously limited as he's moving forward, get something for him now he's a free agent after the season and I would trade Andrew Miller also but only if I got overwhelmed and that would be say Kyle Schwarber for the Cubs which trust me that's not going to happen the Cubs are not giving that guy (laughs) up Miller has great value and he should he's young still he's got great stuff still and he's signed beyond this year so he has a lot of value I don't think the Yankees will end up moving him because I just don't think they're going to get back in return what they need for a guy that good. Tim, this weekend, the Red Sox and Yankees, despite the fact they're going in opposite directions, I've always argued that this is the greatest rivalry in all of sports. And I want to know you, you know, you're, you're, you know, I would say, I believe you as a senior historian, I'm a junior historian compared to you. <laughs> you know, what do you think about the Yankees-Red Sox rivalry and what we can expect to see this weekend from these two teams? Well, I think it's the best one in baseball. Now, Cardinal Cub fans will argue, Dodger Giant fans will argue, I get it. But this one has gone back an awful long way, has a lot of history to it, and it's still very much alive. Now, the Yankees certainly aren't the team that they've been in recent years, and they're not the the George Steinbrenner Yankees, which takes a little luster away. But um, it's still really good, and there's some good games coming up over the weekend, starting with Sunday night, where I'll be. David Price and Masahiro Tanaka, that's a pretty darn good matchup for Sunday Night Baseball. We're going to see Eduardo Rodriguez return to the Red Sox on Saturday. We'll see how well he pitches after you know a quick little stint in the minor leagues. Stephen Wright goes Friday night. We'll see uh, if his all-star experience and not pitching in that in any way affects him the second ha- start to start the second half. Um, and we'll see if the Yankees make some really great push here. And it better start tonight Um, because that's the only way I see them uh, becoming buyers instead of sellers. If they get red hot and win, you know, eight out of nine out of the break, uh, to me that's the only way that they get back in this thing and buy instead of sell. All right, Tim, before I let you go, I I have to ask you about this because 
I saw the article on ESPN.com ranking the top 10 greatest right-handed pitchers. I want to know why on earth is Bob Feller and Bob Gibson at 10 and 6, respectively. It seems pretty low to me. Well, <laughs> there were a lot of questions about those lists, and uh, we could go basically any pitcher, any position, and you're going to have an issue because that's the beauty of baseball is there so many great pitchers and players that nobody agrees upon almost anything. I looked at every one of those lists. We're doing a show that I'm hosting on Friday, a week from today, about all those lists and the best and the worst and everything. It's impossible to get it right. But I would agree with you. Uh, Feller and, um, and Gibson need to be a little bit higher. But you can say that about a lot. I, I saw Grover C- Cleveland Alexander was so far down, I couldn't believe it. Now, granted, he pitched 100 years ago, but if you're going to include everyone, he's got to be way higher on that list among right-handed pitchers. Uh, Tim, really appreciate you joining me on the show today. Remember, folks, this weekend, Sunday Night Baseball, Yankees, Red Sox, Tim will be part of Baseball Tonight, Sunday Night Countdown, presented by Chevrolet, and then the game at 8 o'clock, presented by Taco Bell. Appreciate the time today, Tim. My pleasure. See you.